Good morning, Chapin Baptist Church. It's good to gather with you as we worship again this morning from a distance. To begin our time of worship, I want to read from Romans chapter 5 this morning. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let's sing of that grace from our Lord and Savior this morning. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless and all in wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Sing, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would my cross you lay down you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Jesus, we thank you so much for laying down your life for us. That you became obedient to the point of death for our sake, Lord, and for your glory. It's because of that we can sing this song from our hearts as we're overwhelmed with your grace. Grace, grace, God. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, 
His grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, marvelous grace of our love. that exceeds our sin and our guilt yonder on Calvary's mound outpoured there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled grace grace God's grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is greater than all our sin and dark is the stain that we cannot hide what can avail to wash it away look there is flowing a crimson tide wider than snow you may be today oh grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is greater than all our sin marvelous infinite matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe you that are longing to see his face you you this moment his grace receive grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all our sins in grace 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 god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is greater than all our sin Lord we thank you for your grace that it is marvelous and matchless that though our sin was great your grace was greater it has overpowered every bit of sin in our lives Lord your word says that it's a free gift it's nothing that we've done to earn it but you have freely bestowed it upon us Lord so we say thank you we say that you are worthy of all the praise, the glory, and the honor. For it is you who has done the great work. We love you, Lord. Amen. Good morning, Chapin Baptist family. Thank you for gathering around the Word to worship this morning. I want to ask you to go ahead Take your Bible out, find Philippians chapter 2 as we continue to walk through the book of Philippians. We are going to be 
in Philippians 2, verses 14 through 18. And as you're finding your place, first things first, I want to wish a very happy Mother's Day to all of you moms out there. To my mom, I want to tell you happy Mother's Day. I love you. To my wife, the mother of my children, I love you too. To all of the moms, we love you. We are thankful for you. Now, if you are a husband or a child who is just now being reminded that today is Mother's Day, good luck with that. You've got some explaining to do, uh, so I hope to see you again. I also want to welcome any guests that we have. If you are not a member of Chapin Baptist Church, but you're watching this video to worship with us, we're so thankful that you've joined us. You are welcome, and we would love to minister to you as a church family. If you do not have a church home, I would encourage you to get on our website, chapinbaptist.com, look around a little bit. Uh, we would also love to hear from you if you have any questions. So you can email us at info at chapinbaptist.com. And I also want everybody to go ahead and pull up your email. If you have a prayer request, we want to know how we can pray for you. So go ahead and let us know by emailing us at acts 6 at chapinbaptist.com, A-C-T-S, the number 6, at chapinbaptist.com. We want to know how we can pray for you. So by now, hopefully you are in Philippians 2, verses 14 through 18. What I want to do is read our text as a whole that I want us to have another prayer as we ask God to be gracious to us to let us hear from his word. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says this, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for hearing the prayers of your people. And as I stand in this room behind this pulpit, knowing that many are watching in their living rooms or dens, I thank you that you are able to hear us, all of our prayers, those being spoken out loud, those being spoken internally, silently. You hear all the prayers of your people. We know that in Jesus' name, by the, the work of his crucifixion and resurrection, we have access to the one true God, and so we thank you for being able to speak to you today, knowing that you listen to us. And God, we know that you want to speak to us, and that by your grace, we can listen to what you have to say, so I'm asking that that would be the case. And Lord, I'm, I'm asking maybe in a special way this morning that the people that belong to your church would truly hear everything that you want to say to us through Scripture. Not what we think we're going to hear, not what we want to hear, but what you want to say. So we ask now that you would speak through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So verses 14 through 18 are continuing from verses 12 through 13. And I know that sounds obvious. I know some of you are saying, well, duh, but, but here's what I want to do. I want to read verses 12 and 13. This was the passage we looked at last week. And I just want us to realize that Paul is continuing to write as he goes on. We've had a break from week to week, but Paul kept writing, and it's going to be helpful for us to see this. So just look up to verse 12 real quick. Follow along with me. Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in, in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So here's what Paul is doing. Paul is getting very practical, and this is what I want to emphasize as we get going. Paul has told us in verse 12 and 13 something that sounds so big, and it is. We are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. God is working in us to will or to desire and to work according to his good pleasure. And then he gets very practical in a sense. This is 
one manner in which we work out our salvation. This is a necessity as a church family. If we are going to work out our salvation together, then we are to do all things without grumbling or disputing. And I got to admit, I wish Paul had said this, only grumble over a few things. If Paul had just told us to grumble over a few things, it would be a lot easier, but that's not what he says. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And I want to admit to you, this may shock some of you, but I grumble from time to time. I grumble especially when I have to wait in a long line. You may or may not know this, but I hate, hate waiting in line. I don't like waiting in slow drive throughs I don't like waiting in long grocery lines. I don't like getting in traffic jams. I like being on the other side of the interstate when the traffic jam is going the other way. And I feel so sorry for all the people who haven't made it over the hill yet. They don't see this four-mile traffic jam they're coming to. And I, I just think, bless their hearts, I hate traffic jams. I do not like lines. I tend to grumble when I feel like I'm wasting time in a line. There was a time a few years ago where we had, we had a wedding that I officiated. And we, we had the, the wedding reception going on at the church. And... And then some of us realized, some of our friends, family friends, realized that it was apparently National Donut Day, and there was this new Krispy Kreme that opened up in the area. And so they decided for me that we would be going to Krispy Kreme because it was National Donut Day, and everybody got one free donut. And so we go to Krispy Kreme, and we get in this ridiculous, agonizing line. And, and usually I'm a very happy person when I'm in Krispy Kreme, but yet... In this moment, I started to grumble, and I'm looking at this, this sea of people in front of me, and I'm thinking, we are ridiculous. We are here for one free donut. I think it's like a dollar. I'm like, I will pay money to get out of the line. I was grumbling. That's what I tend to do when I feel like I'm wasting time. My stomach grumbles, especially during staff prayer time. We meet Monday through Thursdays at 1045 in the morning, and that's about the time of day where my stomach starts to grumble. I get up fairly early. I don't eat a really big breakfast, so when it's getting close to 11, I'm really starting to focus on lunch. And there are many, many times, maybe most days, where we start to pray. And you know how it is. You start to pray in a circle. It gets quiet, and then what do you start to hear? You start to hear my stomach grumble and growl. And I want us to use this metaphor, a growling stomach. I want to use this. I want to start to think spiritually when my stomach is growling, it is distracting, it is awkward, it is embarrassing. When my stomach is growling, when it's grumbling, that grumbling, watch this, it indicates my empty gluttony. Because when my stomach's grumbling, it's just because I'm starting to think I'm hungry, I'm not starving, I have plenty of food to eat, I never have to worry about if I'm going to have enough food, as many people in our world do. So when my stomach is grumbling, it's just evidence of my empty gluttony. It's just my stomach saying, hey, I want more. Give me more. And I want to use that metaphor to get us to think about how our spirits have a tendency to grumble. And spiritually speaking, that often means it's just because we're greedy and we think that we're empty. We're not getting what we want. And so I want us to hear what Paul says to us as he is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He says that we must not grumble about anything. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without arguing. Perhaps there was some grumbling in the Philippian church. We don't know for sure. There's evidence that there was some division here later on. We'll see that he has to encourage two ladies to, to get along in, in the previous part of Chapter 2, we've seen where he is encouraging the church in Philippi to be united, to strive side by side. We've been thinking about that unity and harmony that God calls his church to. And so perhaps there has been some grumbling in the Philippian church. Overall, things are very positive at this church, though. I never want us to forget that this is a very warm, joyful, loving tone that Paul shares with the Philippians. And it's the same here at this church. At Chapin Baptist, I cannot emphasize enough how wonderful things are among the people of this church. This is a very positive church, a very loving church, a very joyful church. 
And I want to focus on us today. Everything I say from this point forward about grumbling is about us as a church family. And so even though things are very, very positive at this church, nevertheless, grumbling can still occur. There is always a tendency for us to grumble. We are people. People grumble, and I include myself. We sometimes grumble about the way things used to be. We sometimes grumble about the way things should be. And we sometimes grumble about the way things could be. So sometimes we look to the past and and think, well, it was better back then. And we start to grumble about the good old days. And sometimes we're just looking at current circumstances saying this shouldn't be this way, it should be this way, or I wish this was different, or whatever. We start to grumble. We might look ahead and and feel doubt or whatever. We start to grumble wishing that things would turn out a certain way. And, And if you think about it in life, we actually tend to downplay grumbling a bit. If someone's grumbling, that doesn't really sound too bad. Oh, they're just grumbling. We downplay it. But Paul is very serious about grumbling. And I want us to ask why. Why is he so serious about grumbling? Here's what I want to do. I want you to look down chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. I want you to follow along with me. I'm going to read actually verses 15 through 16. I want to read this, and then I I want us to see the background for a lot of what Paul's saying. He says, that you may be blameless and innocent. So he's told us, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now there is some background, Old Testament background that we may not see on the surface but it is rich. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn to Exodus chapter 15. If you want to follow along with me, feel free to get there. Exodus 15. I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. And here's what's just happened. God has just rescued the Israelites out of Egypt. He has just miraculously, through all the plagues, the Passover, crossing the Red Sea, He has just rescued His people out of their bondage They've been singing a song of victory and celebration. And in Exodus 15, verse 22, I want you to listen to what happens. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. So they've crossed through the sea. Now they're going on their journey. They are in freedom now. They went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. You have about three days without water, and then you're talking about death. So they go three days in the wilderness. They found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water. And the water became sweet. So now God shows another miracle, another display of his power. They can drink this water. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. There he tested them, saying... If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God. That's important. I want you to think about this. Keep this in your pocket. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. In other words, if you obey my word, if you hear my word, if you heed my word, you will have life. Verse 27, then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees and they encamped there by the water. Now before we keep reading, because we're going to go right into chapter 16 in just a second, but I want you to think about this. The Israelites went three days, started to thirst to death, grumbled about it. God miraculously made bitter water sweet. Then he leads them to paradise. Twelve springs of water, 70 palm trees. Just close your eyes and picture this place. Beautiful springs of clear water, palm trees. We know the numbers 12 and 70 are important in the scriptures. This is a picture of paradise. God is showing them 
his provision. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. They set out from Elam. They couldn't stay in paradise forever. He had them go into the promised land. All the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the people of Israel said to them, Now, I want you to hear what they say. This is going to drop your jaw. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. In other words, we wish we were dead in Egypt. It would have been better if we had died in Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. In other words, we would rather be in Egypt dying fat and happy. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. This is how the people of Israel grumbled. God has redeemed them from bondage, rescued them miraculously, provided them water miraculously and abundantly. And then when they start to get hungry, they accuse Moses and Aaron and therefore God that they brought all the people out into the wilderness to kill them with hunger. This is how they grumbled. Now what I'm going to do is turn to Numbers chapter 14. We're going to fast forward a little bit in the story. God has led his people to the border of the promised land. He's had spies sent into the promised land to spy out the land. And what they came back telling the people is that the the people in the promised land were too big for them. And so everybody started to get nervous, didn't like the plan. Numbers 14 verse 1, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. This is how the people of God grumbled against God's plan. We would rather go back to Egypt. We don't want the leader you gave us. We don't want to go into this land. You bringing us in this land to kill us. No, we're going to select another leader. We're going to go back to Egypt. I'm going to skip to verse 26. Numbers 14, verse 26. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. And of all your number, listed in the census from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness." That's how God responded to the grumbling of the people that he rescued out of Egypt. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Paul says, These things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So we can read stories like this and be instructed what faith should look like what doubt and grumbling looks like. And I want you to think about this. The grumbling of the Israelites was evidence that they doubted God's provision and that they doubted God's protection. That's why they grumbled. They didn't think that God was going to give them water and food, and so they grumbled. They didn't think that God could protect them if they followed him into the plan that he had prepared for them. They doubted his provision and his protection, and so they grumbled. If the Israelites were guilty before God for grumbling about these things, dying of thirst or dying of hunger or dying from an army of giants, then I wonder how does our grumbling stand before the presence of God? 
it is so easy to criticize the Israelites and to say, you you just got rescued. You just walked through the Red Sea. You've seen God's power over water. How can you possibly complain about not having water? How could you possibly think it's better to go back into Egypt? He just threw a log in the water and made it sweet. He led you to paradise. Then you started complaining about not having enough food. He provided manna. He rained bread down for you miraculously. He provided quail for you. Then you began to complain about water again. Then he leads you faithfully right up to the land of his promise. He promises to take care of you and you doubt it. It's so easy for us to criticize them thinking that if we had been in their place, we would have had faith, we wouldn't have grumbled. But I want you to think about how our grumbling stands before this same God. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to fill in your own illustration here. I was tempted and I tried to think of a way to illustrate grumbling that can take place in the midst of our church body. I don't want to do that. I want you to do that. I want you right now to think about the, the ways that you grumble. And I can think about the ways that I grumble. And I guarantee you this, your grumbling is not in the face of circumstances as dire as the Israelites. And yet you and I still grumble. And the nature of our grumbling is that we doubt God's provision. We doubt God's protection. And in a sense we're saying it would have been better if we went back to Egypt. We are accusing God of leading us intentionally into despair and death. Saying, you know what? No, I'm going to turn right around and I'm going to go back to Egypt. Thank you very much. That is the core nature of our grumbling every time we grumble. So why? Why should we do all things without grumbling and disputing? Paul is firm here. Do all things, everything, with no grumbling or disputing. Why? He gives us three reasons. Number one, we must not grumble because we must shine. I want you to read along. Look at verse 15. I'm back in Philippians 2. I want you to look down at verse 15. That word that may say in order that or so that. Paul is giving us a purpose for not grumbling or the result of not grumbling. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We must not grumble because we must shine. When Paul says that they shine as lights in the world, he's echoing Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, 3, where the prophet Daniel is prophesying about the end times, the resurrection times. It says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is what Paul is saying. You shine like lights. You shine like stars in the world. He says this generation is crooked, twisted. It is lost in darkness. And that's the truth. We live in a generation where it is crooked, it is twisted, it is lost in darkness. And I'm not being critical by saying that. What we mean is that there is a straight path of truth and yet generation after generation and ours is no exception. People get lost. The path gets crooked. The path gets twisted. People are desperate all over the world trying to find the direction that their life should go and it gets crooked and twisted and it's dark and they get lost and we must not grumble because we have a calling to shine in this world God's light. We are called to reflect the light and the glory of God through Jesus Christ in this world. We are to be like the moon. You know this, the moon does not have its own inherent internal source of light. It only reflects the sun. You know this, you've probably heard a hundred preachers use this illustration. We are the moon. God is the sun. The glory of the sun far transcends any glory of the moon. And yet the moon, as small as it is compared to the sun, it can kind of look dirty at times. Sometimes it's not full. Sometimes it's just a sliver. Sometimes it's covered up by a fog of cloud, but it's there. And when you can see it, any light that you see is reflecting the sun. That's what you and I must do. We must reflect the light of God in this world. Reflection is our only option. 
It's our only option. Paul says that we are to be blameless and innocent and unblemished. And when we read that, we realize that's not possible in and of ourselves. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our best deeds in our own inherent nature are like filthy rags. You and I, in our sinfulness, are dirty, dark, fogged over, showing no source of true light. There's absolutely no way that we on our own can be blameless, innocent, and unblemished. And yet there is one who was. Jesus Christ lived without sin. He was the blameless one, the innocent one. He was the unblemished lamb, the perfect spotless lamb that died on the cross for us, rose from the grave. We can only reflect his light. He is the light of the world and we have to shine like moons that reflect his glory into this world. And so there is an implication For each one of these reasons that we shouldn't grumble, there's an implication. If we must not grumble because we must shine, then logically speaking, here's the implication. The more we grumble, the less we shine. So the more we grumble as a church, and again, I'm not criticizing us. This church is wonderful, but since it's made of people, you and me, we know there's grumbling going on. The more we do that, the more we fall into that trap, the less we will shine the glory and the light of Christ to a world around us, a world of people that need to see his path. So that's why Paul is so serious against grumbling. The second reason, we must not grumble because we must hold fast to the word of life. Look at verse 16. Holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. This is just continuing the sentence that we've been reading all along. Verses 14 through 16. The manner in which we are not to grumble. The manner in which we are to shine like stars. The the way that we shine reflecting Christ is by holding fast to the word of life. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to Deuteronomy 32. I want to fast forward in the story of the Old Testament where the generation that was born into the wilderness, God said this first generation that he brought out of Egypt, that one is going to die except for very few that were faithful to him. He says your children that you thought were going to die, they're going to be raised up. And this is what Moses says to the second generation as they are getting ready to finally prepare to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy 32, verse 45. When Moses had finished speaking all these words to Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today, that you may command them to your children that they may be careful to do all the words of this law, for it is no empty word for you, but your very life. He's saying this is the word of life that I'm giving you. By this word you shall live long in the land that you are going over to Jordan to possess. In, in the first part of this chapter, he's singing a song. He calls the first generation a perverse generation, children in whom there is no faithfulness. He calls them a crooked and twisted generation. That sounds so familiar to what Paul's saying in Philippians. Then he tells the next generation, I'm giving you a word of life. It is no empty word, but your very life. We must not grumble because we must hold fast to the word of life. Just like the second generation of these Israelites who had gone out of the wilderness into the promised land, Paul wants the Philippians to make it to his promised land, to God's promised land. He wants them to make it. He doesn't want to see at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry, that he had run in vain. He doesn't want to see that he had labored in vain. He doesn't want them to be wanderers. He wants them to get there to God's destination, heaven, an eternal, perfect relationship with God and all of his people. And this is our generation's opportunity too. We have the opportunity to cling to the truth of God, to follow His path, to walk towards His promises. Let's hold fast to the Word, Chapin Baptist. Let's hold fast to the Word of life. Remember Eleazar from just a couple weeks ago. 
Eleazar is a soldier who his hand clung to the sword as he brought about a great victory. That's what we want to do. We want to hold fast to the word. I want to read to you a description of the Bible. I hope that this encourages you. I want you to listen to Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. Because I want us as brothers and sisters in Christ, I want us to continually grow in our grasp of Scripture. This is the word of life. When we open this word, when we seek to understand what God is saying, when we seek to obey it, to apply it into our lives, we are heeding the word of life, our very life. And I just want you to listen to this. My hope is that hearing words like this will inspire you to hunger For the bread of life, the bread of the word of God, I hope this makes you hunger more. Listen to what the psalmist says about God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Maybe you need reviving in your life. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Maybe you need a surety in life. Maybe there's something you're uncertain about. Maybe you need true wisdom. It's found in God's word. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Do you need joy to revive in your heart? This is what God's Word does. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I want to ask you, as you're sitting there right now, does life seem dim to you? Do you feel as if you're walking through life blind? The Word of the Lord is pure, it enlightens the eyes You need God's Word. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. We reverence God according to His Word. This is His eternal power. Listen to this. God's Word is, verse 10, more to be desired than gold. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned in keeping them. There is great reward. We need to hold fast to the word of life. We have got to maintain a grasp of being biblical people, seeking God through Scripture. Not only do we hold fast to the word, Paul's language could also be translated as holding out the word. We are also to hold out the word so we cling to it. We cherish the truth of Scripture. We hold it tight in our life, and yet we also open it before others. We hold it out. We show them the gospel. We show them the biblical truth of a God who loves us, calls us into relationship with Him, and will make sure that we get there. We must not grumble because we must hold fast to the word of life. And so I want you to think about the implication here. The more we grumble the looser we will hold the word. So if we find ourselves grumbling against God, grumbling with one another, what happens is our grasp of Scripture gets loosened. We may think we've got a a hold on, we we won't. That also means that as we try to hold it out to someone, we we could drop it. If we are grumbling, we are reckless with the truth of Scripture, that means we may not effectively get it to the person we're trying to hold it out to, so to speak. So the more we grumble, the looser we hold the word. We've got to hold fast to the word of life. Third reason that we must not grumble. We must not grumble because we must rejoice. We must rejoice. Philippians 2, verse 17, Paul says this, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. We must not grumble because we must rejoice. This is what Paul is telling us, but let's, let's be real. What in the world is he talking about? Some of you may have been thinking that. What is he talking about? Even if I am poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, like what, what is that? What is he saying? Well, this is what he's doing. He's drawing on an image of of worship in those days where they would bring an offering before God. They would sacrifice that offering. At times there would be a drink offering poured on top of that. And he says, you know what, even if I am that drink offering poured out on top of your sacrificial offering, the worship of your life, even if I'm spent, poured out over that, I rejoice. Paul says to his 
protege Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 6. He knows he's about to die. So he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. So Paul is telling the Philippians, even if it costs me my life, even if it takes everything I have, even if it kills me, if I am used to be a blessing and affirmation and encouragement on your life of worship, your sacrifice of faith, in that I will rejoice. And then he says, and you rejoice with me. Why would someone rejoice over this? First, because they will make it. They will make it to God's destination. They know by faith they are not going to be left in the wilderness wandering around. No, they have a God who's faithful and who will lead them to his promises. Chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says this, I am sure of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul knows deep in his faith that he will be able to boast in the day of Christ, the day when Christ returns, because when the Philippians are there, there will be obvious truth and evidence that God has worked his faith among them, worked his joy among them. They know they're going to make it by God's grace, and in that they can rejoice. And on top of that, and this is the challenge, rejoicing as they spend their lives Paul is describing the essence of worship when he says sacrificial offering. This is the essence of worship. You and I tend to think of worship as singing and praying and all that, and that is it. But the true core nature of worship is to be offered on an altar. Romans 12, in view of God's mercies, we are called to lay our lives down as living sacrifices, as a spiritual act of worship. This is what Paul is talking about. We rejoice in the life that we receive in Christ, but we also rejoice as we spend our lives and maybe even lose our lives for the sake of those who need to hear the word of truth. And I know that the thought of losing our lives could, could be so foreign to any of us right now. I don't, I don't know how often you really think about the fact that if you have life in Christ... As Paul says in Galatians, it's not you who live, it's Christ who lives in you. You no longer have your own life. You never had real life. You only have life in Christ. And when he comes in, he takes over. And the life you live, it is only in Jesus Christ. And he is calling you to spend your life for him. And that could mean that you lose your life for the sake of Christ, for the sake of shining the truth of Christ in this world. We have so many who need to hear the word of life, so many who need to see the light of the world. Our worship is used. Our lives as sacrifices, saying, God, we, we die to ourselves. We want to live for you. Here's my life. Do what you want with it. Take it. Consume it. Spend it on your glory. When we do that, the nations can see the truth of Jesus Christ. But if we're grumbling, we hinder that. You see, we must not grumble because we must rejoice. We must truly worship. We must offer our lives as worship. But the implication there is the more we grumble, the less we rejoice. The more we grumble, the less we're truly worshiping. The less we're truly worshiping, worshiping, that means the less that we really are offering our lives as sacrifices to God to glorify His name through us. So I want to ask you, I want to invite you as we Close, will you rejoice with me? Will you rejoice with me? I admit to you as a brother in Christ that I grumble too. I often doubt that God will provide. I often doubt that God will protect against our real enemy. I often look God in the face, not necessarily realizing in the moment, but I look at him and say, you know what? I think I'd rather turn back around and go where you found me. No, we can't do that. We have to walk into the salvation that God's working into our lives, and I want you to be with me. I want you to rejoice with me. So in the midst of our grumbling, can we confess that? 
Like right where you are today, can you just internally, in your mind, in your heart, just start to own up to God the ways that you may find yourself grumbling among this body of Christ? It's always going to be a problem. We, we are people. That's why Jesus came to redeem us, but we still have the opportunity to rejoice. If you are a child of God, God has promised to get you to the promised land. I want you to know that for certain. And you can rejoice in that. If you are a child of God, He's promised to get you there, and all along the way, He is your living water. He is your bread of life. You don't have to grumble thinking He's going to let you spiritually thirst to death or spiritually starve to death. He is the one who will walk you through. He has already defeated your enemy. And I want you to rejoice in that. Will you bow with me? Let me pray for you. God, I, our weakness, my weakness, our weakness as people is so evident to me right now. And that's not theatrics. I'm not being theatrical. I, well, I'm just so aware of how weak we are in the flesh. Well, we can't even last three days without water. We can't even last but a few days without bread or we would perish. And spiritually speaking, we're no better. We need you. We need your living water to well up in us. We need the bread of life. Jesus Christ, we are reminded that you are the bread of life. And that man does not live on bread alone, but man lives on every word that comes through your mouth, Lord. And I pray that we would seek that, that we would realize what our true thirst is, what our true hunger is. And that for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied, Lord, because you are our satisfaction. So God, I confess for myself and in behalf of this church family, we are often empty gluttons. Well, we are we are greedy. We want to hoard according to our own preferences. We convince ourselves into thinking we need more and more, and that just leads us to spiritually grumble. So God, I pray that you would help us to take grumbling seriously. Realize we must not do it. We must shine your light in this world. We must hold fast to your word. We must rejoice over you, our Savior. I pray this in your name. Amen. Church, let's sing together as we respond to God's word this morning. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. Those He saves are His delight, Christ will hold me fast. Precious in His holy sight, he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last bought by him at such a cost he will hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. For my life He bled and died, Christ.
Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with Him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sign. When He comes at last, oh, and He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Oh, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast, for my my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For our benediction, I want to read to you from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, as we go back and see what Paul's prayer, his initial prayer for the church in Philippi was, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.